Okay, gang, take your Bible, open it to John 14, all right? John chapter 14, that's the fourth. I often call them biographies. They're called Gospels of Jesus Christ in your New Testament. We're going to start there in just a few minutes. How many of you can remember that very special day when you saw your baby take their first steps? Isn't that a be- Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, that is a big time event in most households. Now, Many of you know me, we don't have children, but in my cell phone, I have more first step videos and photographs from you people than I can possibly count, right? Because it's such an enormous event. It's a landmark achievement when this little sort of fleshy ball or blob of, of, you know, life can finally, you know, put it together and figure out, you know, how to move. They've been crawling for months. But now all of a sudden, they're taking steps. It's beautiful, isn't it? That's why you post all those photos and videos. You're dying to get grandma to see this for herself. It's a big, big event. Now, as cute as that is, as wonderful as that is, as cute as babies are, this just in, sometimes babies are not so cute, right? I mean, look at those children. My patience wouldn't last 10 minutes under those circumstances. I mean, that child would wind up probably locked up somewhere, and I'd be in jail, all right? When a baby acts like a baby, we expect that because they are a baby. We expect them to grow out of it. So much of this comes from babies being babies. I mean, think about it. They are totally dependent on others. They are demanding. Do you see demandingness in those faces? They are completely self-centered. They can't feed themselves. They're constantly making messes. I have been in the hospital maternity room many, many times when a father gets to change that very first diaper. Do you know about this? It's the most disgusting thing imaginable. I've heard stories of fathers, of brand new baby, girls and boys, cute and precious as they can be, gagging in a maternity room, trying to get through changing that very first diaper. Sometimes babies aren't so cute. Those things are natural parts of babyhood, but we tolerate them because we know they're growing and eventually they're going to grow out of them. But what if they didn't? When you run into an adult, that's completely self-centered, demanding, totally dependent upon circumstances and other people to help clean up their messes. That's not an attractive sight, is it? Something has gone horribly wrong. Something has gone not just sideways, something is out of order. That's what we're going to talk about, growing. For a follower of Jesus Christ not to grow and remain like that is not only a shame, it's harmful to that follower of Jesus Christ. We expect followers of Jesus Christ to grow just like we expect our toddlers to grow into children, children to grow into adolescents, and adolescents to become little people, young adults, so on and so forth. Today we're launching a four-part series entitled Plus One. And Plus One is our effort as a church The staff of this church has put this together to help you grow up in your faith walk. Today, what I want you to see is that the faith walk begins with an authentic relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but then continues in growth. In fact, that's the big idea. I'll put it on the screen. My faith walk begins with relationship and continues with growth. Now, follow me. I hope you get this. There's relationship and there's growth. There's relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and then there's growing that relationship. Now, listen very carefully. You can have one without the other, but I'm hoping today you realize you wouldn't want to. It'd be like fries without ketchup, or ketchup without fries. The two go hand in hand. My faith walk begins with relationship, but continues with growth. It's all about relationship. Listen very carefully. You don't want to try to grow without relationship. Nobody grows truly in their faith walk without an authentic relationship with God. 
To try and grow is empty. It's lifeless. In fact, we have a word to describe that kind of faith walk. It's this word, religious. When you try to grow, but there's no relationship, it's religious, but it's not very effective. And if you've been around long enough, you've probably heard someone in the church say, you know, that's one of the things that separates Christianity from other world religions. It's really not a religion. It's a relationship. See, you can grow and you can have a relationship and you can try to do that independently or one or the other, but why wouldn't you want both? To try and grow without an authentic relationship with God through Jesus Christ is religious, but it's not very effective. It's like a formula. It's like a to-do list. It's like, go to church, check. It's like, Sing a song, check. Give something in the offering, check. It's like, say a prayer before your meal, check. The Pharisees in the Bible, in the New Testament, the Pharisees were all about the formula. They were all about the checklist. We call that legalism. You've heard that term before from me. Legalism is religious. Legalism is a formula. And by the way, Legalism is alive in every world religion, not just Christianity. Because legalism really isn't a religious problem, it's a people problem. We are naturally legalistic. You know what legalism does? Legalism says, I'm better than you because I do this and you don't. I'm closer to God than you because I don't do this and you do. That's what legalism says. Legalism seeks to possess something, a relationship with God, without the relationship. It's all about the steps. That means, listen, prayer to a legalist, to a religious person, is merely a citation to an impersonable deity. That's what prayer is. Worship is an obligation. It's a duty. You have to do it if you're going to appease a judgmental deity. Giving is all about being a good person, and good people want to help others, so I give when I can. When it comes to relationship, these things change completely. Prayer is about a personal conversation with a personable, knowable God. Worship is about an expression of gratitude and praise for all God has done for me. Giving is an action of obedience and surrender in light of all that God has given to me. You see the difference? In John chapter 14, Jesus wants his disciples to understand that difference. He wants them to know that as his followers, they're not like the religious giants of the day, the Pharisees. He wants them to understand that God, the God of Jesus Christ, is personable. It's knowable. We can engage in relationship with our creator. And again, That's one of the distinguishing marks of Christianity. Anybody who tells you that all religions are basically the same, one of two things is happening there. Either they've never seen authentic biblical Christianity demonstrated for them, they don't know it, or they've never studied world religions. Because in Islam, Allah is not knowable. He is not personable. We don't call Allah Father, according to Muhammad. We appease Allah. We try to stay on Allah's good side. In Hinduism, the gods, and there are many, are not personable. You cannot know them. Even in Judaism, Old Testament, Orthodox Judaism, God is not knowable. He's not personable. Only Christianity not only connects us to our Creator, but allows us to know our Creator. That's what Jesus wants the disciples to figure out in John 14. Look at verse 1. Now remember, this is on the Thursday night before his execution Friday morning. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled, guys. Why were they troubled? Because back in chapter 13, in verse 33, he's told them, I'm leaving. I won't be with you much longer. So they're troubled. Watch this. You believe in God... Believe also in me. Now, take this in for a minute, because this is big. How do you suppose the disciples, who had only hung out with Jesus for less than three years, 
How do you suppose they believed in God? Probably the same way the spiritual giants in their culture, the Pharisees, believed in God. God was impersonal. God could not be known. God was a deity out there that was all-powerful, that was all-knowing. You better watch out. You better straighten up. You better do the right things. You better follow the proper formula. Watch what Jesus says. You believe in God. I want you to believe also in me. So what's he doing? He's doing two things. He's saying, number one, I'm equal with God because Jesus was God. You believe in God? Believe also in me. It's not a, you believe in God and you have fond affection for me or you kind of dig me. No, you believe in God? I want you to believe in me. So he's establishing the co-equality between father and son. But also, also, Jesus wants to make sure that his disciples understand They already have a relationship with God. Their creator can be known. Why? Because they know him. They know Jesus. Here, in verses 2 through 4, he gives us that famous discourse. Okay, I'm leaving. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. But I'm coming back to get you. And then verse 5, look at Thomas. Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus says, verse 6, I am the way. I I can see him touching his chest. Thomas, I am the way. I I am the way. I am the truth. I, I am the life. You're standing here talking to me. Jesus, in human form, is demonstrating to his closest followers that because they could see him, they could hear him, they could touch him, Because they could relate to him, they could know their creator. They could have relationship with their father. Keep reading. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Now watch verse 7. If you really know me, first thing I got to point out to you. See the word you? If you really know me. The word you in the Greek language is plural. So Jesus isn't just talking to Thomas who asked the question. He's addressing all 11 of his closest followers. If you really know me, they had the relationship. They just didn't know it. Watch. If you really know me, me personally, I'm standing right in front of you. You know my father as well. How cool is that? These disciples who had been with Jesus for less than three years, the only understanding they had of God was an impersonal deity. Along comes Jesus who says, I am the way to God. In fact, I and the Father, we are one. If you see me, you can see the Father. If you talk to me, you can talk to the Father. If you know me, you can know the Father. In fact, from now on, here comes verse, end of verse 7. From now on, from this moment in time, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the Gospel of John, chapters 13 to 17, they're considered the farewell of Jesus. This is the last remaining hours he has with his disciples. From now on, from this moment on, you do know him. You do have a relationship with your creator because you have seen him. Jesus is establishing the disciples' relationship with the Father through himself. They just didn't realize it yet. The foundation has been laid. Now they just need to grow. So from that passage, we can define relationship. Now, the reason this is important is because what I know what a lot of you guys think. It's the same thing I think. Whenever a minister starts talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, somehow to me that sounds feminine, right? A personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Somehow that bothers me. I don't know why. It just does. So I know what a lot of you guys are thinking. You're thinking, okay, okay. I'd rather you give me that to-do list. I can work my way through a to-do list. But you start talking about personal relationships, and I get a little nervous. I struggle in my personal relationships here, much less with God. The reason I bring this to your attention is these were men's men. These were fishermen. These were carpenters. These were rugged individuals who survived. And Jesus said, because you know me, you can know God. 
from that passage. Look, let's define relationship. Here's what it is. Here's all it means. Don't be afraid of this. Relationship means it's authentic faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. He's the boss. He's the king. And that allows me to know God as Father. Do you understand that every time I stand up here in a message or otherwise and I talk about a relationship with God, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about authentic faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus, I believe you are who you claim to be. I believe, as this book says, you died Friday for me. You bore my sin on the cross. And Sunday, you took that life up again. You defeated both sin, death, and the grave. You gave me new life. I believe you are Lord. So I'm going to follow you. All right? Knowing that allows me to know God as Father. See, you and I access the Father through Christ and only through Christ. That's why Jesus said, look, guys, I am the way. No one gets to the Father. No one knows the Father except through me. Trying to grow, trying to follow the rules like the Pharisees did, the counterparts to the disciples, is lifeless. It's useless. It's religious, but it's not relational. And our churches are filled with people who are still trying to do it. They're still trying to hit those marks. They're still trying to climb those ladders. They're still trying to make those accomplishments. They do it all to feel good about who they are, what they can give God, but they don't know him. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees most often? Guys, I don't care what you do. The fact is, you don't know me. You don't know me. So don't tell me about your offerings or your elaborate prayers. You don't know me. There's no relationship. Now, let's switch gears and talk about growth. Growth is always a sign of life. If something is growing, there is no doubt it is alive. Dead things do not grow. Like our physical bodies need to grow, our spiritual bodies need to grow as well. We need to develop spiritually. Uh, very quickly, I decided to throw this on the board. This is kind of cool, a little chart. might give you some idea of where you are in the faith walk. There are basically four stages to spiritual growth and development. The first is birth, birth and infancy. This is all about a new beginning. This is the moment you decide to embrace authentic faith in Jesus Christ. You are born again, as Jesus put it. It's all about survival. Someone help me, please. That's why it's so important that others in the church, when they recognize someone's spiritual interests, that they come alongside that person because they're going to need help. Next comes Childhood. Childhood is about gaining a new perspective. It's about growing in knowledge. It's about taking biblical precept, biblical principle, and saying, yes, as a follower of Jesus, I will follow it. So tell me what to do. You tell me what to do, and I'll try to do it in my marriage. You tell me what to do, and I'll try to do it with my checkbook. You tell me what to do, and I'll try to do it with my attitude. You tell me what to do, and I'll try to handle that in my relationships. You tell me what to do. Why? Because I'm growing. I'm gaining knowledge. Then there's adolescence. Adolescence is all about the challenge of walking by faith. You see, it's easy as long as someone's leading you around. Someone's got you by the hand. Adolescence is when you begin to stand on your own. Adolescence is learning that the just shall walk and live by faith, not by sight. And then finally, there's maturity. Maturity is like a new calling. I begin to realize that my faith walk is not solely about me. I am responsible for a much bigger picture. That's why service rises to the surface. Take your Bible and turn back. Turn back through the Gospels, through the early epistles, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. I want you to go to three pastoral epistles. There are three of them. Uh, these books were written by the Apostle Paul to two ministers, one Timothy, who was a pastor in Ephesus, and one Titus, who was a pastor in Crete. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse 1. Paul is about to describe... Well-meaning churchgoers who are not growing. Watch, verse 1. But mark this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. There will be terrible times in the last days. The last days, when the New Testament uses that term, it's typically referring to the, 
the season before the rapture of the church, when God recalls his children and then begins the tribulation and the great tribulation. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud. By the way, he's not just talking about those people we see on the news. He's talking about people inside the church. This book is addressed to a pastor about a church. In the last days, it's going to be bad. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I am so, so very concerned that we see a lot of that in our churches. Not those churches, this church too. All churches. Watch what happens. Verse 5. Having a form of godliness, a form of godliness, there's a little resemblance there. I mean, after all, they do raise their hands when they sing. I mean, after all, they do give money in the offering plate. There's a, there's a form of godliness there. I get it. But they deny its power. A form of godliness, but denying its power. Follow me, church. The power in your faith walk, the power in my faith walk, is the power to overcome the pitfalls of this world. Now listen very closely. My relationship with God through Jesus Christ overcomes my death. It overcomes my sin. It overcomes my failure. But if I'm going to overcome the problems associated with living, I've got to grow. I've got to go beyond a form of godliness. I've got to take hold of the power that's found in that relationship. How do you do that? You grow that faith walk. There are probably many reasons we do not grow. This week I gave it a little thought. I came up with three. Why don't we grow? Why don't we grow as followers of Jesus? I think the first is because we're creatures of habit. We sort of get comfortable in our own routine. Uh, do you know how many conversations I have with folks who say, man, tell me about small groups. Well, listen, we got a small group meets at my house on Wednesday nights. Oh, Wednesday's bad. Wednesday night, the kids have this, kids have that, kids have the other. Many of you are around long enough to remember when we used to have midweek connection on Wednesday nights. You know why we don't today? Because so few people can get their family here. Why? Well, because, you know, the kids play ball, and the daughter's got dance, and there's softball, and there's this, that, and the other. Do you know I grew up leaving Wednesday practice 30 minutes early because my family insisted that my butt be in church on Wednesday night? And I started, and I played, and nobody punished me, and nobody turned their nose up at me, and nobody made fun, at me, up fun of me. My mother and my father simply walked to the coach and said, look, We've got church at 7 o'clock on Wednesday evenings. So i got to pick him up at 6.30. He can't stay as late as the other guys. I hope you won't hold that against him. You know what the coach said? Get out. No, that's not what he said. He said, sure. Sure. Of course, you know, I was pretty good. <laughs> we're creatures of habit. Hey, we're starting a small group. It meets every other Thursday. Ooh, Thursday's our fish night. Your fish night. Here's, here's reason number two. This is big right here. We don't grow because we want a savior, but we don't want a master. We love the idea of our salvation. We just don't want to talk about the sanctification that comes with it. That part where Jesus kind of cleans us up, changes us. We don't like that. We love the idea of talking about heaven one day, especially when we lose someone we love. I'll see her again because she had a relationship with God and I have a relationship with God through Jesus. I'll see her again. Well, let's start talking about obedience now. Nobody wants to. C.S. Lewis wrote, we want not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven, a senile old benevolence who likes to see the young people enjoying themselves. <laughs> He's right. We don't want a father in heaven with authority we wanted a sweet old grandpa 
who lets us do our thing and pats us on the head because he loves us, just wants to see us have a good time. That's what we want. That's why we don't grow. Here's the third reason. We're willing to settle. We don't like being stretched. We don't like inconveniencing ourselves. We use comparison and rationalization to feel good about ourselves. See, why should I concern myself with God's standard when by my standard, I'm better than most of you people? And that's what we settle with, right? As long as I feel superior to someone else, then I must be on the right track. This is why we do not grow. One last passage. Go ahead. Keep turning back in your Bible through the book of Hebrews and James. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Very quickly, and I'll wrap this up. Peter, the author of this epistle, was one of those original 11 that Jesus said in John 14, if you know me, you know God. So along comes Peter, and he writes in verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 1, his divine power, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, the divine power of Jesus. He's given us everything we need for a godly life. Everything. In other words, the foundation is there. Through Jesus Christ, the relationship exists. In my relationship with God, through Jesus, I have what I need. He's given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge, oh, again, the importance of knowledge. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, well, through what? What are these? These are his own glory and goodness, the glory and goodness of Christ. He has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, through the promises, by the way, do you know the promises? Do you know any of the promises that Jesus made to his followers? Have you committed any of those verses to memory? Through the very great and precious promises, you may participate in the divine nature. Bam! What does that mean? That means you can begin to think and react like God, who is your Father. Through the promises of Jesus Christ, we are then able to participate in not the sinful nature, not the broken, fallible human nature. We're able to get glimpses, participate in. Look, not going to lie to you. We're not going to strive through it constantly, okay? We're going to turn it sideways sometimes. I do often. But we get an opportunity to participate in the divine nature. We don't have the ability in our broken, fallen, sinful, depraved selves to skillfully manage our way through life. We just don't have it in us. That's why we fight. That's why we refuse to speak to that person. That's why we can't rein in our spending. That's why we can't get serious about our commitment. We're going to make poor choices. We're going to make impulsive decisions. We're going to do things that are inappropriate and downright stupid. And that's going to lead us to less than fulfilling lives. But our faith, our faith in light of who we know enables us to participate in his nature. Keep reading. That way we'll escape the corruption of the world that's caused by evil desires. Do you know what the corruption of the world is? the brokenness, the perversion of the world. I'm not talking about stuff that goes on in Las Vegas, right? Or New York City or Hollywood. That's not what the corruption of the world is. The corruption of the world is the brokenness of the world, the depravity of the world. The corruption of the world are all the things that we hope to escape. Broken hearts, broken marriages, broken relationships, broken promises, loneliness, anger, bitter a refusal to forgive. We'd love to escape those. He's telling you how. He's saying in your relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, it's all right there. You have what you need. So what should I do? Glad you asked. Verse 5. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. What is that if it's not growth? For this reason, you ought to be trying to grow. You ought to be trying to add to that relationship. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. And then he gives a long list. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, 
mutual affection and love. Compare that list of a growing follower of Jesus to the list that Paul gave in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The form of godliness, but with no power, no meat, no muscle. For this reason, make every effort to grow. Verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, sounds like growth, doesn't it? Increasing measure, getting stronger, getting bigger. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of Christ. Peter says that if you're not growing, if you've got the relationship, even if your faith is authentic but you're not growing, you're going to wind up ineffective and unproductive. Peter is saying, don't you realize you've got everything you need to solve your relationship problem in Christ? Don't you realize you've got everything you need to lower the stress level financially? in Christ. It's all right in front of you. It's right there. You've got to make the effort to add to that relationship to escape the corruption of the world. So from that passage, we can define growth. Now I know what growth is. Growth defined are additions to my faith in light of my relationship with God, who is the authority in my life. Additions to my faith. In light of my relationship with God, who is the authority in my life. Now, don't, don't miss this. In contrast to the legalist, that religious person who lacks a true relationship with God, Peter's going after a sincere follower of Jesus who does not grow. They go to church when it's convenient. They might get swept up in the emotion of the music. They want to help people, so sometimes they give, but that's about it. The relationship is there. Don't misunderstand. The faith is authentic, but there's no growth. There's no depth. It's useless. In fact, we have a word that describes that kind of faith walk. It's this, superficial. It's superficial. There's no depth to it. There's no genuine concern for other people. There's no growing knowledge. There's no sacrifice. There's no self-discipline. Their marriage looks like anybody else's marriage. No better, no worse. Their financial situation looks like everybody else's financial situation. Their problem-solving skills are elementary. And oh, for goodness sakes, don't ever ask them to forgive someone. They don't have it in them. They're superficial. They love good music. They'd love to help out at the church. But doggone it, we just never have the time. We're so busy. Makes them feel good to put something in the offering plate. They're well-intentioned, but there's very little follow-through. Let me tell you what they are. They're children. They're cute and all. That's about it. That's about it. Look, two things and I'll quit. Jesus developed a close following of 11 disciples. Now remember, of those 11, one would eventually betray him. And the other 10 would take months to figure it out and embrace the mission. They didn't know it that night. Peter is one of those original 11. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand, look, gang, it's not about being religious. It's not about trying to grow, trying to do the right thing without the relationship. The Pharisees do that, and they don't know me. You do know me, and because you know me, you know God. So here's what we know. We know that growth without relationship, well, that's religious. I'm not interested. But then along comes Peter. Again, one of the original 11. And he says, but hang on, hang on. Once you know the relationship is authentic, you need to grow. Don't stay there. Churches full of immature, self-centered, undisciplined followers of Jesus Christ, they miss the mark too. So, growth without relationship is religious. Relationship without growth is superficial. Gang, there's no room for either one of those in this church. Oh, we're all broken, and we'll give you time, and we expect you to, you know, kind of catch up eventually. But we're not here to coddle you. We're not here to make you feel good about coming to church. You know why we're here? We're here to help you grow an authentic relationship with your Heavenly Father. And that's what Plus One is going to be all about. Let's pray. 
Father, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the reality that we can have relationship without growth and we can try to grow without a relationship, but why would you ever want to? Show us how to unite those two ideas. Help us, we pray. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you, Grace Community Church. Fantastic to see you today. I mean that. I'll see you next time.